When was the last time you had fish? I don't remember. <laughs> you don't remember? Oh no. And when was the last time you had lobster? Never. Never? You've never had... There's lobster everywhere. It's not for Cubans. <laughs> it's not for Cubans. It's for tourists. Yes, for tourists. <laughs> Rampant inflation, communism and a struggling economy. A dystopian combination for such a picturesque location. I'm in Cuba, a Caribbean island known for its cigars, rum, music and fun, as well as getting stuck in huge conflicts between international superpowers. It's also the most fertile ground for Bitcoin adoption that I've ever seen. My name's Joe Hall and I'm a reporter for Cointelegraph. Joining me on this trip is going to be this guy, Paco de la India. We flew to Cuba to investigate the growing Bitcoin community I'd read about in the book Check Your Financial Privilege by Alex Gladstein, the CSO of the Human Rights Foundation. Plus, I wanted to attend Cuba's first ever Bitcoin meetup. But before we get there, there's one more thing Cuba is famous for. Nuclear Armageddon. Yeah, you heard that right. The Cuban Missile Crisis occurred in 1962 during the Cold War, just one year after Cuba became a communist country. Thankfully, that crisis was averted, otherwise we wouldn't be here, but the communist state of Cuba endured. Even today, the Cuban economy is centrally planned, which means it's run by the government. This is Cuba. Let's go on a Bitcoin adventure. But it's so old, man. No, it's all red. It's like Marxism. You stop me, man. Dude, I'm so you made, scared. You made they it. stopped me for like 15, 20 minutes. To every checkpoint, he got stopped. I sailed through. Paco was went into a separate line. Was quizzed by other people. What were they saying? He's to like, you? "What do you do here? Why are you here?" And I'm like, "I make videos." He's like, "On what?" I'm like, uh, "Bitcoin." He's like, "So you give advice on Bitcoin?" I'm like, "No, I make travel videos." And then he was like. Uh, Show me. I'm like, here, I don't have internet. He's like, even I don't have internet. <laughs> True story, they didn't have internet. Welcome to the fish dish. How old are you, Like 30 something? Uh, I am 33. 33, okay. Yes, yeah, so this cold is older than us, and yet he has a garment at the same time. And there's a lovely fake apple sticker just to. Paco, have you got your seatbelt on? No, there's no seatbelt. <laughs> they didn't think about safety back then. There's no seatbelts. It's no bloody seatbelt. Do you have a seatbelt? <laughs> there was no danger in the 50s. Wow. Life is better, I think. Te conoces de Bitcoin. Aquí se habla un poco de Bitcoin. We are online in Cuba. Check the download speed. <laughs> Apparently, we've got 0 0.06 download, 0 0.04. Upload. Bitcoin doesn't need it to be any faster than that. So this will work for Lightning, this will work to pay for stuff, and this will work to send money places. We've just linked up with uh, two of these sort of louder voices in the Bitcoin community. We're going to go for dinner with them at a place that accepts Bitcoin. It's called El Cuarto de Tula. <laughs> So my friend here who doesn't want to reveal her identity is showing me how to buy Bitcoin bits here with Telegram group groups. Hey, what's up? Please, bro. Yep. Buy. So Cuban pesos. Yep. Okay. So now she's doing the transfer of Cuban pesos. Yeah. So that's how you buy Bitcoin peer to peer in Cuba. Telegram groups over Lightning, almost zero fee, or basically zero fee. One person back. Pretty quick. And you just post it and share it on Telegram groups. So the government doesn't know that they're sending Cuban pesos to each other for the purchase of Satoshi. It's fucking wild. So cool to see. Blew me away how much people are putting into Bitcoin here. How much they're educating themselves, how much they're realizing they need it. And one of the girls we're talking to, she's putting pennies into Bitcoin. She knows that in 10 years time, 20 years time, 30 years time, Bitcoin will still be there while the Cuban peso might not be. You know, using all these digital tools to find a way to build for her own future. How phenomenal is that? 
Also, she says the groups are growing. There are more and more people interested in this technology. The other thing is they don't care about bull runs. They don't care about bull runs in bear markets because when the peso is so bad, you know, Bitcoin can crash from its highs of 69,000 to 4,000 and it's still doing better than the Cuban peso does over time. I've never seen a use case as strong as Cuba for Bitcoin adoption. It's just absolutely wild. So this morning we've come to Mr. Navi's to sell a little bit of Bitcoin for some Cuban pesos to have some cash in hand. However, he's told us that it could take some time because we have to count out a lot of paper money. Yeah, you'd give wads of cash for like really small items. It's such an inconvenience, such an inconvenience. But I guess that's what happens when your, your currency is hyperinflated. And that's 1,000, that 1,000 is equal to $5. So there's 20 mil. So 20 mil, how much is that in dollars? Uh, 100 bucks. 100 bucks, and it looks like that. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten. Three hundred. This is only $400 and look at all this paper. So it reads the invoice and I press send. I say, yep, yeah, sure. Yeah, you got it so fast. Yeah, yeah. I really love it. I really love it. This is something incredible. $400 is the monthly salary of three or four professionals. Like doctor. Even your atomic engineer can make $100 a month, something like that. Oh my god, and that's what it looks like just down there. Bueno, el salario mínimo es $2,500 pesos. $12. So the minimum salary is $12 US dollars a month. And the average salary is about 4,000 Cuban pesos, which is roughly $23 per month month. That is frightening. As my friend Katria explained, the average salary for a Cuban is peanuts. I have literally no idea how Cubans live off this amount of money. A study by Columbia Law School concluded that, despite the direct and indirect government subsidies, the cost of living in Cuba is completely disproportionate to workers' earned income. According to the study, a Cuban's average salary covers just 12.5% of their living expenses. But as Katria explains, Cuban salaries are lower still, and they cover something in the order of 3 to 8% of projected living expenses. I'm going to try to explain to you what is going on with the money here. You're familiar with an American dollar, okay? So two years ago, one of those was worth 25 Cuban pesos. Because the currency has devalued so much, nowadays, supposedly, it's worth 120 pesos. But the official rate and the rate that we pay is actually 200 pesos. Okay, 200 pesos. So we've gone from $1 being worth 25 pesos to 200 pesos in just two years. It's devalued eight times. Four months later, and the peso has crashed even further. One dollar is now worth 250 pesos, or 10 times less. <laughs> I'm in danger! For me, Bitcoin is real money. The money that we have is not worth anything. My parents had money in the bank. With the intention of buying a house. I told them that they would change a Cuban Cuban Bitcoin to o aunque sea hacia dólar, y no lo hicieron, y al final se devaluó, se devaluó tanto la moneda que con todos los ahorros de toda su vida ellos no pudieran comprarse ya nada, probablemente ni una bicicleta, con los ahorros de, de 20 o 30 años trabajando, para que yo voy a ahorrar en un dinero que cada vez pierdo y pierdo y pierdo más poder. So I'm here with Vitalio, who's the other co-founder of the Cuban Bitcoin community. Vitalio was saying an interesting phrase earlier about how Bitcoin could be the salida or the exit. El cubano cuenta eh, con, con el peso, el peso cubano, que es una moneda que solamente tiene valor dentro de las fronteras cubanas. Es decir, yo salgo ahora hacia otro país y no puedo, eh, no puedo adquirir ningún bien, ningún servicio con esa moneda. El Bitcoin eh, nos da esa libertad de poder eh, traspasar esa frontera. Sin Bitcoin, nosotros estamos encerrados aquí. Pero ya el Bitcoin, al ser un, un dinero que es universal, un dinero que no, no conoce una frontera, es la, la, esa salida, ese escape que, que puede ayudarnos a la familia cubana. 
mm. le ayudaría mucho. The government controls the majority of the means of industrial production, agriculture, energy, manufacturing, telecoms, banking, telecommunications, you name the industry, it's likely they control it. Price controlled goods can be bought in these places called tiendas or shops, a network of government run stores. However, in these government run stores, they accept the MLC. Whereas if you have pesos, you can expect queues and worse quality products. To find out more about the MLC, which sounded a lot like a CBDC or a central bank digital currency, I reached out to Eric Garcia Cruz, the founder of Cuba Pay and Bitremesas. He has been a little critical of the regime of late and is now on Cuban humanitarian parole in the US. What is the MLC? In Spanish, is moneda libremente convertible. It's a shit coin that is legal with dollar. Like Luna. It sounds like UST. Yeah. <laughs> From Luna. Yeah, yeah. You give me your dollar and I give you a shit coin. And you can use that shit coin only in the stores to buy food. So this is the MLC card. So basically you're spending dollars, but in reality it's spending MLC, which is what the government tells you is dollars. The government issuing MLC in return for USD is a way of the government collecting or stacking or saving USD. There is a, a reason for that, because the government, the only way they have to trade with some country is using fiat physically, you know, using the dollar bills yep. and not using a digital transaction like any other country could do. Cubans are also given a predetermined amount of subsidized food on a monthly basis. There are often shortages for Cubans of basic food stuff that you probably ate today. When was the last time you had fish? I don't remember. <laughs> you don't remember? Oh no. And when was the last time you had lobster? No. <laughs> never? You've never had... There's lobster everywhere. It's not for Cubans. <laughs> it's not for Cubans. It's for tourists. Yeah, for tourists. <laughs> At any point in Cuba, you're always 30 miles or 50 miles, I think, from the coastline. And yet this is the first time my friend is eating lobster. How cool is that? But also how sad is that? It's supposed to include things like chicken, eggs and milk. But if you ask my friends here, the last time they had some eggs... Bueno, por suerte huevos, mi familia me manda. ¿Y un vaso de leche? Hace rato. ¿Hace rato? Sí. ¿Hace cuánto tiempo, más o menos? No sabría decirte, pero hace rato. <laughs> Just think about how easy it is to get a glass of milk in whichever country you're in right now. While these price controls help maintain affordability for essential goods, they also create distortions in the market, leading to shortages, black market activity, and disincentives for production and investment. Meet Julian, my new Cuban-American friend who's one of the lucky few able to set up a business in Cuba. Following a series of protests in August 2021, the communist government of Cuba relaxed laws allowing the creation of small and medium-sized businesses. While it might seem like a step forward for Cuba, there was also a lot of red tape and bureaucracy standing in the way of creating a business. But for my mate Julian, it was a bit easier, thanks to being born in the US to Cuban parents. So Julian and his dad run a tourism business as well as Mr. Navi's, a bar and restaurant that sells goods it's hard to get your hands on in Cuba, like consumer electronics and even sex toys. You pay in pesos, but you can accept Bitcoin? You, yeah, yeah, you can pay in pesos, but we can, you can, we can also accept Bitcoin as well. Dude, let me just tell this. One dollar is 200 pesos. Yeah. yeah. One dollar is 200 pesos. Yeah. That is 25 cents. Yep. <laughs> Miami people, South Beach. Yeah, right. <laughs> what were you doing to us? <laughs> I paid $6 for a bottle of water. We make our own snacks as well, our own coffee, our own chocolate um, powder for your milk. And, yeah, you, yeah. And, you, and why do you make it all yourselves? We, we make it because it's somewhat difficult to, uh, in order to reach people, like the Cuban people, you know, there's not, that many, there's not like, a, like a supermarket here. In Cuba, there is no Walmart, McDonald's, or big chains. And you can absolutely forget your Starbucks Fenty Latte. And that's what we're trying to have here. We're trying to make a supermarket for the Cuban people. And that's what we don't charge in dollars, we charge in pesos, so then the Cuban people could afford it. Ah, pesos or Satoshis, right? Or Satoshis, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is five cigars. We have two Portagas and three Romeo and Juliet Church Churchills. These awesome. ones are nice. Thanks so much. It wouldn't be a Bitcoin documentary about Cuba without buying some Cuban cigars with Bitcoin. This is probably one of the coolest purchases I've ever made. <laughs> Let's go. <Sweet. laughs> it's almost like being Cuban is risky. Why don't you use exchanges, crypto exchanges in Cuba? 
muchos te ponen la limitación de que por ser cubano no puedes entrar. Binance, Coinbase, muchísimo. Simplemente por ser cubano, tener una, un pasaporte cubano o una identificación cubana, en Cuba estamos bloqueados. El embargo económico, eh, comercial y financiero. A ver, estás bloqueado por IP, pero si llegas a entrar usando una VPN, si desconectas la VPN y ven que tu IP era cubana, te bloquean la cuenta, incluso si ya la, podiste, si ya la fondeaste. Si nosotros elegimos estar en Bitcoin y ser soberanos con nuestro dinero, ¿para qué se lo vamos a dar a alguien para que nos, para que nos lo custodie? Esa no es la solución. Bitcoin se creó para que cada cual fuera dueño de su dinero y cada cual decidiera qué hacer con él. Eso puede ser hasta una ventaja, porque para usar muchos de estos servicios tienes que hacer un KSC. Sin embargo, en Cuba, como ya por desde entrada, por default, estamos denegados, pues no, nunca podemos hacer KSC. Entonces es bueno para nosotros, por lo menos a nivel de eh, privacidad, mejor que no tengan nuestros datos por ahí. No, I mean, it's kind of interesting, right, that because you can't access exchanges, you have to use Bitcoin and Lightning in a peer-to-peer -peer way, which means that you learn how to use it better, which means that you learn about custody, self-custody, mm -hmm. how to use Bitcoin peer-to-peer. -peer. It's, it's kind of cool in a way. Ser cubano es un riesgo y, mira, Satoshi no lo hizo para los cubanos, pero como que nos viene muy bien Bitcoin, literal. There are no exchanges in Cuba, as unfortunately it's very hard to register as a Cuban citizen due to the embargoes. However, Bitcoin finds a way with peer-to-peer -peer transfers on telegram groups, signal groups, and in-person meetups. Bitcoin always finds a way. We're going to do a peer-to-peer -peer trade using Telegram and the Lightning Network and Kateria is going to talk us through it because this is one of the things that she shows Cubans how to do. But I'm going to create an offer and Kateria is going to buy it off me. Slash. Sell. Create a sell order. It's going to ask me how many. Selling sats for sale pay. So how much um, can I sell like, right now? 20 pesos. 20 pesos. Let's do 20. Enter the payment method. So you have cash even. I'm selling you sats. Your offer has been published. That was done automatically. That's cool. Yo voy al canal de ofertas. La tuya es esta última. Yeah, that's me. It's my offer. Buy Satoshi's. Entonces, para poder enviarte, necesito que me envíes una factura con un monto y él te dice la cantidad exacta, 389 satoshi equivalente a 20 pesos. Mm -hmm. Copio la factura. Wow. El bot so just come, So it's just come through on mine saying, hey, somebody wants to buy you 389 sats for $20. No, 20 pesos. Um, so I'm going to copy that. I'm going to open it in a wallet and then I'm going to send. So okay. it's sending, sending, sending. Yeah, a mí ya me avisó. It's already got there. Okay, well, I guess it's lightning, right? Me avisó. Debe pagarle 20 pesos por cash. Oh, thank you. That was, there you go. Sí, entonces doy fiat cent. Ya te lo envié. Entonces, cuando el vendedor confirme que recibió tu dinero, deberás liberar los fondos. ¿sí? I can sí. tap on release. Sending. Yeah. Your sats have gone through. You. Super yeah. rápido. A growing number of private bars and restaurants in Cuba accept Bitcoin. We visited five of them in the capital, spending satoshis for mojitos, frijoles, and Cuban sandwiches. I asked the owners why they choose to accept Bitcoin. Why do you accept Bitcoin here? We started accepting as another way to accept money with the problem that we have in Cuba, the economic problems that we have with a lot of different currency. You are accepting Bitcoin because you are dealing with a private coin, the government hasn't access to the transactions, you do it, and you have the freedom to do whatever you want with that. Decidí, a ver, investigar lo que era, y me di cuenta de que yo puedo resguardar mi capital, y empuse a comprar algunos bitcoins. Lo que más me encantó de bitcoin es la libertad que uno tiene con su dinero. Yo puedo ir a donde quiera y tener mi dinero. Entonces ahí dije, bueno, yo voy a orientar mi negocio, voy a so I was speaking to my friend here and he talked to me about the law of Cuba. If you're a private organization and you accept crypto, you're on your own. There's no law that prohibits you from accepting crypto. What does that mean if you're on your own? That means the government doesn't interfere into it. That's the positive thing. For example, you are a foreigner and you come to Cuba and with Beacon, you can you don't need to bring cash, it's a lot safer. It's an opportunity to connect to the world and to have a currency that actually uh, means something to uh, people in any part of the world. There is a big problem for all the businesses in Cuba. And the problem is, how do you pay to your providers? You can't pay to your providers with CUP or MLC. So the suppliers you're talking about here are foreign suppliers, presumably in the US or Mexico. I am orange peeling those suppliers. 
I am very excited for Saturday, which is going to be Cuba's first ever Bitcoin only meetup on the island. And it's going to be a place where people like Catria and Forte come together to discuss how to use Bitcoin on a daily basis and how to avoid this financial apocalypse which is affecting Cubans all over the country. It's really heartening actually. It's, uh, it's cool to see. Good morning. We ordered a taxi today using Cuba's version of Uber, which is another sign that Cuba is opening up. It pretty much works like Uber, but with uh, some slight Cuban differences. Yeah, like you can get this car also on there. Like yeah, I mean, you can technically order one of these on La Nave. But again, this didn't exist three years ago. It's wild how fast it's changing here. Hola, buenas. You walk into the meetup and there are just people sending people sats, people learning how to use the Telegram group, people generally sort of asking questions, being curious about Bitcoin. And it's men, women, children, elderly people, young people. It's not like the Bitcoin meetups in, a, in countries in Europe, for example, where it tends to be a lot of white middle-aged men talking about the, the fall of the death of fiat currencies. It's a happy vibe and it's uh, yeah, optimistic, hopeful, and just very fun, really. I'm saving Bitcoin for my own retirement. <laughs> I'm self-administration yeah. of my retirement fund. Wow. But how old are you? I'm 24. And you're right saving for your retirement at 24 with Bitcoin? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can do it in Cuban pesos and USD dollar. All that is kind of shit coin, so I have to use Bitcoin. Wow. Para mí no solamente un un dinero, no es una representación de valor, es toda una ideología. Mm. Significa muchas cosas, ¿entiendes? Es la descentralización, la libertad de que tú seas dueño de ti mismo y, y que puedas interactuar en el mundo con una, una libertad, libertad plena. Eso Bitcoin desde que en Cuba empezó a, a llegar más fácil la internet a los móviles y lo uso para trading. Si se pudiera llegar a más personas, como lo estamos tratando de hacer con las comunidades, creo que las personas que después que lo conocen no lo abandonan. Me ha permitido, digamos, a utilizar servicios que no podía pagar y me ha ayudado con la inflación también. The meetup was the culmination of months of hard work, stress and anxiety. Forte, Catria and Vitalion risked the scrutiny of the Cuban government to organise the event. And to see such a wonderful positive response from the local community was a lot to bear. Me siento un poco eh, cortada, super emocionado. Muchísimas gracias. Nice. We are about to get into a pink Cadillac as a little gift to the Cuban Bitcoin community organizers because they've never done it before. And you know, can't live in Cuba and not do this sort of thing. First time, bro. First time for them. First time. Very first time. time. First time. Very, very wow. Good. While using Bitcoin might not be illegal in Cuba, using a drone. Definitely is. No, guys. <laughs> How was the meetup? How was the meetup? Very good. We liked it. We thought that it wouldn't be very many people, and they liked it and paid attention. Very emotional. Very marvelous. We didn't think that the people would have had so much acceptance y tanto interés por, por el Bitcoin en Cuba y, y esperemos que se repita. Y lo van a repetir, ¿no? Sí, sí. Hubo, repetir. hubo mucha gente que no tenía Bitcoin y salió con Bitcoin de ahí. And people were really happy. They didn't just come there for food or drinks, they just came, they sat there to listen. So, congratulations to another Bitcoin meetup next month. And to getting home safely. Remember, don't start revolution. Uh, <laughs> And thanks to Coin Telegraph for this car. <laughs> yeah, Coin Telegraph. Cheers. Cheers, bro. <laughs> As I look back on a week spent in Cuba, I can't help but feel more optimistic and more joyous about the future of Bitcoin adoption in Cuba. There's one big thing standing in the way, and that's the risk of the government cutting off the internet. They could do that, and they actually did that last year. During the protests, they turned off the internet for over a week leading to blackouts and inability to communicate and to connect online. 
Bitcoin is, of course, digitally native currency. It lives on the internet. It's magic internet money. But even if it were to go offline, the Cubans that have already stacked sats or saved in Bitcoin, it would stay in their wallets until the internet comes online again, or they find a new way to access their internet. So yeah, the genie is out the bottle here. Bitcoin is here and Bitcoin is like a mushroom, you know, you can leave it in the corner, you can throw shit at it and it'll still continue to grow. Turn the lights off, whatever, it'll still grow. And I've never seen a country like this in all the countries I've used Bitcoin in, which is so fertile and so ready to take Bitcoin and run with it. It's lightning native, it's peer to peer, it's easy to use and with a population that's educated higher than any other country I've seen in the world. Everyone here, the taxi drivers to the waiters, they all have degrees in engineering, medicine, lawyers, you name it. They are far superior educated to anyone you meet in the US or Europe. There's a bright orange future for Cuba and people are grabbing it and they're seizing it with their hands. That fills me with hope, fills me with optimism. And this has been a really moving experience for me, but I know that there's now Bitcoin as a salida, a Bitcoin as a way to resolver or to solve the problems that people face on a daily basis. A hyperinflating currency, difficulties in transacting, difficulty in receiving remittance, and difficulties in starting businesses. Bitcoin resolves and fixes all of these things in a smart, easy to use, and digitally, na digitally native way. That is a message of hope for Cubans. That is a message for the Cuba of the future. This has been Joe Hall reporting for Cointelegraph.